Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, Menopause in the Workplace. I'm delighted to welcome you to this session, and I hope that you enjoy it. This is a collaborative webinar between the Cooperative Bank, Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce, DLA Piper, and Women in Banking and Finance, and with thanks also to the Federation of Small Businesses. Moving on. So uh, my name is Emma Holt and I am the, the current president of Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce and I'm delighted to chair this session today. By way of introduction to me, I am a senior lecturer at Manchester Chamber University uh, where I lead the business law units at undergraduate level, as you can see there on the slide, and I'm the programme leader for um, our global online degrees. And I, um, before I joined the university, I was solicitor, I practiced law for almost 20 years, including 10 years in senior management and leadership roles. Um, and I'm now in my practice solicitor, and I'm delighted to chair this session um, today. Moving on, please. So what, what are we going to be covering? Well, please note that the session will be recorded, as it says at, at the bottom there. And the topics that we're going to cover um, are captured here on this slide. So first, we're going to have a look at the law. So we're going to look at specific laws and legal guidance around laws and cover the definition and symptoms, the business case for businesses to provide support, developments in the case law and some case law examples, particularly dealing with disability, sex and age discrimination. And shortly, I'll be handing over to Emma Mills, who is a partner at DLA Piper, and she will be um, addressing this area. Then we're going to move on to look at the policies that employers have in place. And I'm um, going to hear from Emma Redfern, who is a business partner at the Cooperative Bank. And she's going to talk about how to set up those policies and how to introduce a management policy within the business. Then we're going to move on to um, hear a case study. So first-hand experience of the menopause in the workplace from Bernie McEverly, who is Head of Compliance Oversight at the Cooperative Bank. And then we're going to hear from Kathy Douglas, who is Chief People and Sustainability Officer at the Cooperative Bank, is going to be talking to us about the Elevate Gender Network at the Cooperative Bank. We're going to take questions throughout the session, so please use the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of your screen to post questions. We'll answer those questions if the panels were going along, but also there will be time at the end of the session to take further questions. And um, so please do so continue to pop your questions in there. And also, if we could ask you to leave your email address so that we can answer if there are any outstanding questions that we haven't um, been able to answer in the time we have, then we can answer those um, subsequently. So I really hope that you enjoy the session, get a lot out of it. And I'm delighted to hand over now to our first speaker, who is Emma Mintz, who's going to talk to us about the book. Thank you, Emma, for that introduction. Um, and as, as Emma said, I'm, I'm good to speak to you all here on the session today. As, as Emma explained, I, I'm an employment partner at DLA Piper. Um, I advise on all aspects of, the, of employment issues relating to the employment relationship, but increasingly the whole area of um, equality, diversity and inclusion is, is a big area of my practice and particularly relevant to our topic today. In that space, we're seeing more and more references to the impact of menopause and activities by employers um, to, to look to address this in the workplace. So it, it's a really hot topic for us. So I, I'm very happy to be able to uh, guide you through the legal landscape in this respect um, on our session today. Um, just before we get into the legal position, just to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of understanding, recognising that we have a range of attendees here who may have more or less experience in this area, we thought it would be helpful just to start off by just highlighting what exactly it is that we are talking about and, and starting there on that slide with the medical definitions. You've got the, the key definition there of, of what is the menopause. And essentially, that's the, the, the time when a woman has had her last period and it's a natural part of the female aging process as estrogen levels decline. Um, as you can see, it usually occurs between the ages of 45 and 55, but actually there's quite a broad range of ages at which um, the impacts can be felt. And particularly, as is referenced earlier in, in the, oh, sorry, later in the slide, we can see there are three 
key stages of the menopause, which really spreads out the impact of that. So we have the perimenopause phase, when a woman starts to feel the impact of that change. And very commonly, that can be started to um, felt even from 30s, certainly going through the 40s, right up to the late 40s. The menopause technically being the um, period when a woman has not had a period for a period of 12 months or more. And then the post-menopause period, once the woman is well established in that phase of her life, but actually the symptoms associated with the menopause can continue for an extended period thereafter. So in total, you can see that we're actually talking about quite a significant proportion um, of a woman's life where they may be feeling the impact in some way or other of the menopause. Um, if we can just move to the next slide, please. What we have here is just some examples of frequently referenced symptoms of the menopause. So when we're talking about women feeling the impact of the menopause, these are some of the things that women may be experiencing. Some of those you might hear referenced quite frequently, things like hot flushes, night sweats, mood swings. But they, as you'll see, it's a much broader range of symptoms and not all women will experience all of those, but many will experience some of those at some stage um, during the menopause and it's probably immediately apparent that some of those could have really quite a significant impact on a woman when it, in her work um, in the workplace and how she is able to perform and, and interact with her colleagues so that, that hopefully that's useful um, sort of setting the scene for, for the landscape of what we're talking about in the rest of the session um, with that in mind if we think first of all as to why has this become such a hot topic We've included a few statistics here, a few facts and figures to highlight really the business case for providing support to um, women experiencing menopause. The first one there, perhaps most obviously, women make up approximately 50% of the workforce. So clearly this is an important issue. And in certain sectors, actually women significantly outnumber men. Um, the second statistic there, which is really quite striking and has been cited on a number of occasions, albeit it does come with a slight health warning, is this, this note that by some estimates, up to 900,000 women may have left the UK workforce early because of the menopause. As I say, there is a slight health warning with that statistic due to the way that some, some research has been extrapolated across the whole population. But nonetheless, I think it does serve to highlight what a significant impact on, on the workforce and ultimately the productivity of the workforce across the UK, menopause as an issue could be having. Um, and there are some further statistics there, which you can see them on the slides. So I'm not going to read them all out, but you can see, and particularly if you look at that final, that final portion there, and I think this is particularly important, the research has indicated that 45% of women believe that menopause, menopausal symptoms have negatively impacted their work performance. So almost half of the female population um, who, who've experienced menopausal symptoms are saying that that's having a negative impact on their ability to work. And also importantly, and this will play out in some of the case law examples that I'll come on to talk about, 47% of women who have taken a day off work related to menopausal symptoms will not tell their employer about the reason for their absence. And clearly that says something about how sympathetic women have felt that their employer would be to hearing about that and perhaps potentially negative connotations or negative perceptions around the impact of, of the workforce. But also goes to show that research so far and perhaps the experience of employers so far, if anything, are underreporting what the impact of the menopause is. And when these issues really come to light, we, we might see that it's even greater than perhaps is, is starting to be realised at this stage. So moving on against that landscape to think about how has this been addressed so far, there has been, as perhaps you would imagine, due to the, this increase in discussion around menopause in society generally, quite a bit of attention from government in terms of what they should be doing um, to address the impact of menopause in the workplace. So there was an independent report back in November 2021 that was commissioned by the then Minister for Employment, Mims Davis, and that contained several recommendations in terms of additional provisions and additional steps that ought to be put in place. The government response to that back in July 22 is also set out there. 
Importantly, from a legal perspective, it was confirmed that it wasn't intended to make any changes to the Equality Act 2010. And that's the legislation which implements protection against discrimination for anyone who's not familiar with it. And the feeling was that the protected characteristics that already exist already provide sufficient protection. And I'll give some case examples of how that has played out. But despite that perhaps negative um, response, there were a number of positive steps taken at that place. So, for example, the UK Menopause Task Force was established. That's bringing together medical practitioners as well as government individuals. And that has been established and the first meeting has taken place. Um, you've also got reference to menopause employment champions to be appointed. And the first of those was appointed earlier this year. That's somebody from industry who, again, will help to lead a holistic approach, bringing together business and government to work to put in place additional support for employers. So those are all really positive developments. Moving on, um, there's been other developments as well. There was also a Women and Equalities Committee inquiry report in July 22. Again, there were a number of recommendations and the government response was published earlier this year. Again, there were additional support and guidance that was put in place. Um, and I'll talk about one example of that in a moment. But again, from a legal perspective, there was a refusal to trial any specific leave entitlement in connection with menopause. It was determined that that was unnecessary. And again, there was a reconfirmation of this view around the Equality Act to confirm that there was no new additional protected characteristic that was going to be introduced. But as I say, perhaps there have been some developments in case law that I'll talk through, which perhaps highlight why perhaps that change isn't as necessary as some people might have thought. Um, Moving on, just to look at that additional guidance and support, a really important aspect of that is the new ACAS guidance on the menopause at work. So this is one, one of the initiatives that the government had committed to. ACAS, as many of you will know, are a support and advisory body which provide advice and guidance on many aspects of, of employment issues and issues in the workplace. So this new guidance on menopause at work is just one new publication within their wider um, library of, of guidance. And it covers a number of areas in terms of practical issues about managing the effects of the menopause, how you might support staff through the menopause as an employer, thinking about policies, training, all of those types of things, how you might talk to staff about the menopause, as has been recognised in, in that research that was indicated, some employees are reluctant to talk about the impact of menopause, and they might not want to talk to their employer about it. It's not for everybody. This isn't a one size fits all approach. But there is some guidance there about how you might go about doing that sensitively. And finally, there's some guidance in relation to actually what is the law in terms of menopause. So for anyone who is looking at putting in place additional support, thinking about your policies and procedures, I would recommend that you reference this ACAS guidance. So on that note, I will move on and actually talk a little, little bit more about specifically what the legal position is. Um, highlighted on the slide for you there are a number of the types of claims that you could already see where the impact of the menopause might be relevant. And as you'll see, that spans quite a wide range. So it includes an unfair dismissal claim, a number of different types of discrimination claim. And I'll talk a little bit more in the case examples about how that can play out. Um, but also health and safety breaches. Um, risk assessment should consider the specific needs of menopausal women in, in terms of the working environment and failure to properly do that can itself um, create issues from a health and safety perspective. What we're actually seeing in terms of claims is actually an upward trend. So Back in 2021, looking at the Employment Tribunal statistics, there was a 44% increase in that one year, albeit coming from a very low number. The statistics suggest that there was a sort of static, a very actually a very slight decline in 22, but the interim figures that we've got for 23 suggest a further significant increase in, in cases. And, and looking at what I'm seeing in practice from speaking to my clients and thinking about the delay in the time in which it takes cases to track through the employment tribunal process and so turn up in these statistics, my full expectation is that that will increase significantly further um, in, in the coming years. 
So moving on to look at some of the specific case examples, and this will help to put the, the flavour as to how the, these issues arise in under those particular headings. And the first case that I wanted to reference here is, is a relatively old case in this context now from 2011. And this was the case of Merchant and BT PLC. And this kind of shows where discussion of menopause in the case law started. So this case was brought as an unfair dismissal case and also a sex discrimination case. And it involved a claimant who was dismissed following a final warning for poor performance. Um, so a very usual performance management process had been followed, leading to a final warning and then ultimately in, when there was a failure to improve, leading to dismissal. During the course of that process, the claimant had given to her manager uh, a letter from a doctor explaining that she was going through the menopause, which could affect her level of concentration at times. Obviously, she was suggesting that, that was impacting on her performance at work. The manager chose not to carry out any further investigation of those symptoms before dismissing, albeit later at the tribunal hearing, he accepted that normally if he was faced with an employee who was raising health issues during a performance management process, there would have been a referral to, to occupational health. And you can perhaps see how that ultimately led to the tribunal upholding the claim for direct sex discrimination. What they were essentially saying was, this female employee who had raised what was essentially a health issue had been treated less favorably than a male employee who would have raised an, a health issue of a different nature. Essentially, he was saying he didn't consider that this female condition was as serious. That led to the successful finding of sex discrimination um, and also because it hadn't been properly investigated, an unfair um, dismissal finding. So that's an important development and shows how even the basic rights that we do have provide a level of protection. But it does require that comparison to be made between a female experiencing the menopause um, and a male employee with a different health condition. And as we'll see, if we move on to the next um, case, what the subsequent cases have been largely focused on is the issue of whether menopause could amount to a disability for the purpose of disability discrimination claims. And that's important because there are additional claims that can be brought in a disability context, and there are additional obligations on an employer to make reasonable adjustments if somebody is suffering from a disadvantage as a result of a condition. So that issue was first considered, or at least one of the first cases considering that was this case mentioned here, Adonashi and Talent Technology Services. So you can see in the description that you've got there, this was a claimant who was experiencing symptoms of the menopause. She described mild flushes that later increased to being intrusive. She talked about how frequently she was suffering from those. She was suffering from disturbed sleep. She suffered from fatigue, memory loss, and lots of the very classic symptoms of the menopause that you often hear about. Um, but she talked about some of those, and particularly hot flushes accompanied by palpitations and anxiety. They were becoming intrusive and disruptive. Um, the GP in the medical report that was available had confirmed that these features were present, um, but there was a reference to the fact that she was experiencing typical features of the menopause. And that led to an argument by the employer that those typical symptoms would not be sufficient to amount to a disability. And that was the key question that was considered. And the judge in that case actually determined that there was a disability here. And as you can see in the quotation on the slide, they said, I can see no reason why in principle, typical menopausal symptoms cannot have the relevant disabling effect on the individual. And in that case, he had little hesitation in concluding that the effect of the, that impairment on the claimant's day to day activities was more than minor or trivial. So he said she was markedly affected. So that was a really important development. It is just a first instance decision. So that means it's not binding on any others. But as we'll see, if we move on to the next example, there's actually been confirmation of this as a principle in later cases involving the appeal level tribunal. So this case of Rooney and Leicester City Council is another one where the issue was raised. This involved a claimant who worked as a social worker for Leicester City Council. The claimant was suffering from work-related stress caused by the conduct of her employer, but is also suffering from menopausal symptoms. And again, you've got some examples. So we've got forgetfulness, forgetting to attend meetings and, and events. And again, that's another very common symptom um, of the menopause, which is cited. Um, and th there's a number of examples of that. 
um, also suffering from fatigue and exhaustion, leading to her spending long periods in bed and talking about other symptoms, which perhaps less common, but certainly do arise, as we noted at the outset, including things like dizziness, incontinence and joint pain. She ultimately brought various claims against her employer, including a claim for disability discrimination in relation to the way in which those menopausal symptoms had been addressed. Those claims were initially struck out, um, but at the appeal stage, it was held that was wrongly decided and there hadn't been sufficient consideration to the question of whether the menopause amounted to a disability. There had been inadequate analysis of the symptoms and, and those claims and the tribunal had given insufficient reasons. Um, the appeal tribunal also found the tribunal was wrong to find that the symptoms didn't have a substantial adverse effect on her ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities, which is the key test. There was no suggestion that the tribunal didn't accept what she'd said and you know, on face value, certainly to me, a lot of those symptoms quite sound quite serious and if they were having quite a significant impact on um, her day-to-day -day activities. So I think we can see that where, where the um, appeal tribunal had concerns with that decision. And if we move on to the next example, we can see this, this issue being explored again. So this is another example where a claimant had been diagnosed with menopause, in this case, early onset menopause, so at a relatively young age, and this claimant had reported symptoms including brain fog, lack of concentration, stomach pain, insomnia, night sweats, fatigue and joint pain. Now, she wasn't suffering from all of those symptoms at the same time. Um, and it was quite unpredictable exactly when those symptoms might arise, how they might impact her. But nonetheless, the tribunal accepted that they were long term, as was required, um, and while individually they may not be substantial, when you looked at the effect altogether, certainly it, it was found that they were and, and she did meet um, the test. There is, however, a slight um, caveat to that. And this goes back to that point about how often um, employees will reference their symptoms. It was found that while she was disabled, they also found the employer did not know of that because Although she had advised the employer that she was suffering from the effects of menopause, she downplayed her symptoms because she was concerned about like, being unreliable. She didn't want to lose her job. So as a result, the tribunal found that the employer wasn't actually aware of the impact that those symptoms were having on her. And that's important because the way the legal framework works is that an employer is not bound to make reasonable adjustments about something that they're not aware of, obviously. And a number of other types of discrimination claim can't be successfully pursued if the employer isn't aware of the impact of the condition. So employers might say, well, if, if women aren't going to tell us about this, then we can't do anything. I would say, or I would sound a note of caution in reaching that conclusion as a result of that case. As you'll see, that was a case from 2019. Since that time, I think there's been a lot more discussion around the impact um, of the menopause. Um, we've seen all of the recommendations that support the awareness that is now around. And it's important to remember that knowledge for that purpose is both actual knowledge, in terms of what you actually knew, but also constructive knowledge i.e. what you ought to have known if you'd made proper inquiries. And I think now, if that case was been determined again, faced with an employee who had told you in some shape or form that she was experiencing menopause symptoms, if you didn't make some further inquiries about that, I think there is a real risk that an employer would be found to have um, constructive knowledge. And so actually, that that outcome might have been slightly different. And, and I think that's to be encouraged. If we're going to actually look to address these issues and avoid the discrimination occurring, hopefully that will improve and that will only encourage employers and demonstrate to employers of the need to make appropriate inquiries. Um, so that, that hopefully gives you a flavor of how these issues are playing out. I think what that means is that adjustments 
reasonable adjustments in a disability context are things which employers are going to have to think about because there will be found to be a duty to make reasonable adjustments for female employees who are feeling the effects of the menopause and that is having a detrimental impact on their ability to perform at work. So that has then led to some discussion and in, in reference in the ACAS guidance and other areas as to what might those adjustments be and obviously the rest of this session we're going to come on and look about how some examples of that in practice but just looking at this from a legal context just to highlight the range of the type of adjustments that you might need to consider that would cover things like physical adjustments in the workplace thinking about the dress code thinking about heating fans ventilation as i say hot hot sweats is a very common um, symptom so thinking about ways in which you would address that thinking about training for managers and staff to make sure that these these issues are being properly considered generally raising awareness to encourage um discussion about this and involvement encouraging a culture where people are, feel comfortable to be open about the, the menopause and its impact um, signposting that's always important whenever you're looking to, to change culture and, and raise awareness of issues and i would say having a, a policy in place albeit the government declined to make that mandatory as a matter of good practice i think that's a really important step um, and i think we're going to hear a bit more now um, in terms of how that might be put in place in practice so on that note i will hand over to emma redford uh, who's going to talk to you a bit more about that Thanks, Emma. Hi, everybody. So we've heard from Emma about the business and the legal case to have a focus on the menopause as an employer. And I'm going to share with you our journey that we took as a bank to introduce in the menopause policy and what it includes. So at the bank, we launched our menopause policy on World Menopause Day two years ago. And I guess in terms of why we did that, so we were really conscious of the increase in awareness and discussion on the menopause and the impact on individuals in the workplace but we knew that there was still a lot for us to do as an employer. We also were starting a conversation with our trade union about the menopause and what support we could provide our colleagues. And we knew from colleagues across the bank that there was appetite and a growing need to open up the discussion. So many women will face the menopause at a critical point in their careers and a lack of support can halt that progression. Experiencing any of the symptoms can pose a challenge for colleagues as they go about their daily lives. And work is such a huge part of colleagues lives that we felt that it was really important for us to start to open up that discussion and introduce a policy at the bank. It's essential for us that our colleagues experiencing the menopause feel supported and included in their work environments. By taking the menopause seriously, discussing it openly and having a policy in place to support those experiencing it, we felt that we could acknowledge it and ensure that we were supporting colleagues to the best of our ability as an employer. We committed to creating our policy as part of our annual salary negotiations with the trade union, which hopefully goes to show kind of the importance that we saw on the policy um, in, in kind of engaging the conversation with the trade union. We wanted to do something meaningful and really understand the impact that it can have on our colleagues. And we also wanted to get the voice of our colleagues in starting that conversation. So we chose to hold a series of you might have lost me then, so apologies if you did. Um, hopefully you, you can hear me and I'm back. Um, so we chose to, to hold a number of online focus groups. These were promoted through our colleague Gender Network Elevate and by our senior leaders across the bank, so including Catherine, who you'll hear from shortly. And we also engaged our chief commercial officer at the time, um, Daryl Evans, in that promotion of those workshops. Attendance was really, was really positive. So we had 150 colleagues across the bank sign up and attend those sessions. And we use the sessions firstly to run through what the menopause is. So really starting at the beginning, what is the menopause and kind of create that kind of shared understanding. We also then talked about the misconceptions, the challenges, and we asked our colleagues to tell us about their experiences, their observations and what they thought that we could do to support them. This really helped us to consider and shape our policy. Moving on then to what the bank's policy covers. When we started shaping our policy, we wanted to be clear on our purpose. Our policy at the bank is designed to facilitate an open and empowering work environment for all colleagues, supporting colleagues who may be experiencing the different stages of the menopause. It's important to remember that members of the trans and non-binary community may also be affected by the menopause. And we aim to raise the broader awareness for our colleagues of what the menopause is, 
how it can impact people in the workplace as well as at home. And then, so Emma's point around signposting, signposting what support is available through us as a bank and then also through our third parties that we work closely with. Our policy includes the medical definition of the menopause and outlines the symptoms that a person could experience. We then direct our colleagues to the different areas of support that we can provide as an employer. This covers things like flexibility around working hours, location, the ability to request more frequent breaks, working in maybe a quieter or a cooler place in the office, adjusting our uniform policy. So that particularly kind of focuses around our customer facing colleagues um, and the uniform requirements that are in place, but being flexible with that and opening up a conversation around what adjustments might that include for each individual based on what their symptoms are. We also provide support through our employee assistance programme, which gives colleagues 24 seven access to free confidential advice. And that's for colleagues and leaders. And then we also utilise our third party occupational health provider to support should we as, as an organisation need further support and, and that kind of medical information in terms of how we can best support and adjust the work environment to enable colleagues to thrive. So now that we have a policy in place, we don't think that our work is done. We absolutely want to keep the conversation going. And that includes reviewing our support, breaking down any stigmas and continuing to educate ourselves and learn together. I'm now going to hand over to our Head of Compliance and Oversight at the Co-op Bank, Bernie McEvely, who will share with you her experience. Thank you, Emma. Um, so I am Bernie McEvely, not Catherine Douglas. You've probably got that showing on, on your screens today. Um, so whilst I'm going to talk about my situation, I think the, the most important thing to say, first of all, is everybody's situation is different. Um, this, this is my journey, but other people have, will have different experiences and that's really important to recognise that as we work through um, adjustments in the workplace I think. Um, so if I can take you to the first slide please um, in terms of I guess a baseline so, so this is more about how I would have described myself three years ago before I started with me uh, perimenopause. Um, so I've always had great memory and recall, I could visualise things from years ago um, never had to write lists, I could juggle lots of things. Um, and I was very good at making the complex simple, taking very complex scenarios and, and making them really simple, easy to understand. Um, and at least in the work environment, I was always very patient with people. Um, so I want to revisit that a little bit in a minute, just in terms of how I would describe myself now and how I um, try and manage so that I can achieve some of that that I used to be. Um, so moving on, if I talk through some of the symptoms that I've um, experienced. So in a nighttime environment, um, it's been a case of just not being able to uh, either get to sleep or stay asleep. Um, so quite often um, I'd be lying awake for hours and hours. And then when you eventually nod off, um, that might last half an hour because then you've um, I, I had sort of um, and continue to have hot sweats, um, jumpy, restless legs. Um, and then, you know, you might get to a situation, I've certainly got a situation where it's two o'clock in the morning and then that would be it, then I'd be awake all night and I'd only start to feel sleepy again when I got when it got time to get up again in the morning. Um, so everybody probably has had a night without sleep in the sense of, you have an overnight, slide, overnight flight um, and you go without sleep for 24 hours and it takes you a, a couple of days to get over it. So I think if you can imagine going through that night after night and month after month, um, I don't know if anybody's watched Celebrity SAS, which just finished recently. Uh, the last stage of that is resistance to interrogation. And there's a reason that they use sleep deprivation as a form of torture. And it's, it's because it breaks you down as an individual. You literally cannot function without sleep. Um, so mentally, um, your mind needs that deep sleep. Your body needs to repair itself as well just to actually um, get through and, and carry on. Um, so that that whole nighttime environment is extremely difficult. Um, but then it also manifests in the day. So what I would what I would find in the day there is you've obviously got that natural fatigue because you have no sleep. Um, and there's a little bit of a vicious cycle because you're so tired then. It, it could be nine o'clock at night and I'll fall asleep for half an hour and that would be the sleep then because I wouldn't be able to get back to it at all. But what I found most of all, and this is important for a work environment, um, 
was that that brain fog, um, that just inability to form sentences and speak coherently and concentrate. Um, and then there's an element then of getting very frustrated because you can't find the words. Um, so I, I remember, not in a work environment, but I remember my wife and I driving, driving down the road one day and um, I said, oh, we need some stuff. I said, what stuff? And I was actually trying to say, we need some windscreen wiper wash. But I couldn't remember the word for windscreen wipers or the wash. And I ended up saying, some stuff for the white wipes. And that kind of hit me as you think, oh, my God, what is happening to me? And I personally thought, am I getting dementia? Because that's what you see in dementia. You, you fall back and you revert back to childhood traits. And that's what I felt was happening to me so it's really scary um and in a work environment it's difficult i think particularly the role i do um is very judgment based um and it's 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 looking at data it's reaching informed decisions it's trying to balance risk and reward for our customers and for for the bank but it absolutely restricted my ability and even con confidence in making effective decisions um because you can't remember things um you can't articulate yourself because you just cannot find the words or you can't finish your sentences um so you end up getting impatient with yourself but you also tend to get impatient with other people then because if they're talking and a thought pops into your head you lose your train of thought and you can't get it back again um so all in all if you, if you look at that vicious cycle it effectively it, it's scary because it just gives you this feeling that you're not yourself anymore um, you've not chosen to be this person. You have no control over it. Um, and you don't know what's happening to you. And I think I, I very much thought I'm not that person that I thought I was and been able to do my job really well. And it was a case that I don't feel like I can do that anymore. Um, what is wrong with me? What else is going on? And effectively, you get into this situation of what I call survival mode, that you just do what you can do. And you try your best to get through each day. So what I'd like to do is moving on, talk about what I did in a, um, in a work environment. So I think the first point is recognising it, first of all. Um, and that's about being open with yourself, being honest with yourself. It's a difficult thing to face up to. I think once you recognise that, it is then easier to talk about it and share it. And I think, you know, particularly my generation, I think about, you know, my mum and her generation, people don't talk about menopause and it becomes a stigma and we give it power because we don't talk about it and it becomes this big taboo subject. So I don't feel embarrassed talking about it. I think like most people, we feel embarrassed for the people we're talking to about it because we think they're going to feel uncomfortable. Um, they don't understand this. But by talking about it, we will raise that awareness and we will get people to understand what it means um, and that's been really important in a work environment because um, I can generally I'm fortunate because I can manage my own workload um, so if for example I've got something very detailed and complex to, to work on I can maybe look at that in the afternoon or tomorrow when I think my head's more in the game um, and then if I think I'm struggling at this moment in time I'll pick things that are a bit easier to, to grasp um, not everybody is fortunate like that. So I think that's something as employees we've got to really think about is how do we um, help people to work differently so that they can um, work in terms of where their minds are at that point of time. Um, and I think humour has definitely helped um, because I'm a great believer if you, if, you can, if you can laugh at things, it tends to help you get through most things in life. And that's really important in a workplace. I think it's about creating a safe space where people can talk about this, people can express themselves uh, and people can just be themselves um, and they can bring that humour to it. It's a, it's a great ability to be able to, to laugh at yourself and get through things. And then I guess on the, on the flip side of things from a personal perspective, um, so I, I tried HRT, I had to come off it because it, it didn't address any of my symptoms and it actually made a, uh, an, uh, an existing health problem worse. Um, so I was left with trying to resort to more kind of natural, sensible type of things. And if you if you look at this, it certainly doesn't look like the the lifestyle of a rock star. It sounds pretty boring, but this stuff has really really helped me. 
Um, so from a nighttime perspective, what I did was I made a commitment that half ten I was going to bed and there was going to be no phone, no TV. I'd read a book, have a fan on, have a, even now in winter, have a fan all, all night. Um, but I also lit a candle and I read and a little candle. And that was about preparing for nighttime. And then actually, as I started to get sleep, I'd blow the candle out. And that was a, almost a transitional state to say, right, I'm going to try and sleep now. Um, but to help with that, I cut out caffeine completely. Um, I drink so much tea and coffee, but I, I got decaf everything. Um, took a cup of tea up to bed at night, stopped drinking um, alcohol, reduced it. And the iron tablets, for example, really helped with those jumpy legs. Um, so that was something else that I didn't have to deal with. Uh, and I, you know, I, I went out for a walk at seven o'clock every day, did a three or four uh, mile walk. And again, it just, all of these things together, there wasn't one thing, but all of those things together made a massive difference for me. Um, and that's not to say that it's helped everything or it's got rid of everything. It hasn't. Um, but I think if I, um, if I look at um, what that means in terms of where I am now, then if I look back on how I described that person three years ago, um, I can still make the complex simple. It just will take me longer and I might not to be able to do it on the spot. Um, I have to write a list for everything, but that again, it's about adapting. It's about making sure I'm really clear about what's on. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's just reaching out as well. So if I think about um, working differently, um, it's also maybe learning to accept there are some things you can't do. Um, and that's, that's possibly not a very comfortable place to be. But I, I can think back to a scenario where my director wanted me to chair one of our risk committees that lasts two hours. And I did it and I had to say to, me, I had to, say to him after it, I, I'm not able to do that again because I can't concentrate to that level it needs to chair it, which is very different to being a participant for two hours. Some days I'll be able to do it, but I can't guarantee I can do it all the time. And But having that conversation meant we were able to say, right, okay, let's forget it. You don't need to do that. It's not important. Somebody else can do it. So that's really important. But I I guess I would say I don't feel like I'm the person I was, um, but I, I try different things to try and keep that there. But it's ev every day is different, really. And I think that leads me on to um, my summary, really, and those key takeaways, um, which is, I guess, that it is different for everybody. So I can talk about my scenario and the impact it's had on me. It, it will be very different for other people. For some people, uh, symptoms will be much more severe, whilst other ones might not be. Um, I think it's really important to understand that menopause doesn't happen in a vacuum. Other life events and other things are going on in that people's life. If you think about um, typical age of somebody going through menopause, if you kind of think 30 upwards, those pe most people have got children and they've got older parents. So if I think this year alone, I've, I've, my, my father's started having falls and has now gone into residential care. Um, but there's been a lot of period of time during this year when I've had to deal with that. And again, it's something else that's going on that you're having to deal with that, again, makes menopause more difficult as well to deal with because it's another thing. Um, and I think the other aspect is that it isn't static. It doesn't stay the same. Um, things can change on a, on a daily basis. Um, if you're on HRT, for example, um, you probably need to play around with that dose a little bit. And every time you do that, things change for you. So it's not a one and done conversation either. As an employer, it's not about having this conversation once. It's revisiting it. It's checking in. It's it's looking in on that person and saying, where are we now? What do we need to do? OK, thank you. And I'm going to pass you over to Catherine. Thanks so much, Bernie. That's great. And hi, everybody. So I'm Catherine Douglas. I'm the Chief People and Sustainability Officer here at the bank. Um, I joined the bank just over three years ago. Um, I came in a very much of a commercial role and stepped into this Chief People role at the beginning part of this, this year. Um, I've also been um, perimenopausal for um, the last three years now. I've recently had um, a hysterectomy as well, which has obviously pushed me further um, into, into the menopause. So I can really relate to Bernie's um, story and, and some of the symptoms that she's absolutely seen. But I'm actively involved in diversity and inclusion, and I'm actually the executive sponsor of our um, Elevate um, network, which is the bank's uh, gender network. So I could just ask you to, uh, to move on to the next slide. 
So I think here at the bank, uh, we are very you know, committed to having um, diversity and inclusion um, networks. And I think that the role of our Elevate, our gender network has been uh, really, really key and really sort of important. And they have been particularly focused around sort of the menopause. So again, if I can just move on, I'll talk about some of the work that uh, the team have actually been doing. So I think, you know, over the last few years, Elevate has been really working closely with colleagues across the bank to improve the experience in relation to sort of menopause and working very closely with the people team and I think this is where our networks can be very powerful because we do ask them to sort of work with us on policies uh, and what we want to see you know changing in the workforce as well to really support our colleagues so we held a lot of virtual consultations with colleagues who were experiencing the menopause I think really just to lift the lid as I, I you know people and colleagues internally have heard me say to actually take away the stigma to get people to feel comfortable um, to actually talk about it really openly because I think we did really need to understand um, the needs you know and as we've heard earlier on in, in today's presentation the impact that that can have on on females uh, throughout their working life and unfortunately we've seen some obviously the court cases and the tribunals that has resulted in so we totally wanted to understand the impact of them at work and the changes that we could make um, I think what came out really clearly uh, when we were holding our various webinars, and I have to say that the most attended webinars um, across our business, which I think was also very encouraging. And I was very encouraged to see that we had males and females um, on those and, and leaders of, of females within our organisations really wanting to understand more about the menopause and the impacts that it can have. So how do we make those reasonable um, adjustments? So I'd, I'd definitely advocate having either face-to-face -face meetings, you know, webinars about this topic to really drive some of those issues out and I think that also then helps us how we built our menopause policy and the adjustments we needed to make but the most powerful thing about it that came out that we've actually established a menopause matters community this is again that safe space where people can discuss their experience share tips talk about you know HRT and how they're seeing if that makes a difference or how their bodies are changing and their symptoms are changing over time. Um, and I think we've also facilitated some really small scale department support groups for women just to feel that they can talk about it very, very openly. But I do feel as a chief people officer that, you know, I need to constantly keep raising this at an exec level and at a board level to make sure that we make the, the changes that we absolutely need to do. Um, and it's something we're very conscious of as a people team. So just moving on to my final slide. Um, I think the key areas of focus for, for our network, you know, we've got eight um, key focuses that well, women's health is obviously really important to us along with gender bias. Looking what we can do in that parenting space as well. Carers as well, we're seeing a lot more we need to sort of consider around. So, you know, whilst we have been very influential as a network around sort of menopause, we've also been, you know, influential around um, fertility as well and recognising that that is a key sort of concern for, for our colleagues. Um, we've done a lot of network Networking. So you know, networking around menopause, networking just around some of the, the gender issues that we're seeing. And we partner well with Refuge and Northern Power Women as well. So we're getting that external perspective on how we can really focus. So thanks ever so much for your time today. I think that um, ends our presentation. I think we're going on to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you to all of our panellists. I think that was um, really, really great, very informative um, and, you know, really helpful to hear. So we've got some questions in the chat, uh, in the Q&A, just to raise. So um, maybe if I can start with a, a legal question to Emma Mills. Um, how long does someone need to experience long-term symptoms for a disability adjustment or, or a claim to be appropriate or valid? So long term for disability purposes is either that something has lasted for 12 months or is likely to last for 12 months. So I think given the time frames that we've been talking about in terms of the impact of the menopause, I think from that long term perspective, it's quite easy to see that in a lot of cases you would be able to establish that the impact was long term. Thank you. And if I can just ask another question to two of you that's... Um come up in the in the Q&A. Is there any guidance to support self-employed women that you're aware of? I'm, I'm not aware of any specific guidance for self-employed workers. That's not to say it isn't out there, but it's not something that I've come across so far. But I think, to be fair, actually, quite a lot of the guidance, which is directed at employers and employees, would be of more general 
impact. So I think actually even thinking about self-employed workers, um, that, that that would be a useful resource. Um, and in terms of the legal issues that I was talking about, it's important to remember that discrimination applies to workers more broadly than just employees. So actually, from a legal context, um, the impact on self-employed workers that you might be working with is, is just as important. Great, thank you. And just, um, I will put questions to, to other panellists too, but just, this question may well sit across a few a few panellists, but um, one, one attendee has asked about smaller organisations and whether we would still, still advise having a separate policy um, or to integrate that policy within, within other policies. I wondered what your views about that. Yeah, pe people might take different views on this, but for me... I think if you are genuinely a small organisation, um, I think there is always a judgment call as to how many separate standalone policies that you want to have in place. I've seen some very small employers with an enormous handbook of policies, which I'm not sure is that practical for them to manage. So I think often this might be something that you could build into a broader policy in, in that case. But equally, if it's something that you're really facing issues with in the workplace, then actually putting in place a standalone um, uh, policy policy might be useful for managers and might really help with that kind of signposting of a cultural change that you want to make in your organisation. So maybe that doesn't give it a firm view either way, but I think it's a <laughs> judgment call. Great, thank you. So um, in terms of other questions, or, or maybe if other panellists want to, to address that too, um, we've got a question about how to counter stigma around the menopause, particularly for smaller teams. And I wondered whether um, Emma Redfern or... Um, Bernie or Catherine, to comment on that? I'm, I'm happy to take that one, Emma, if yeah. that's helpful. Great, um, thank you. I, I guess kind of to point to kind of the conversation that we've had here today, I think it's about talking about it. And that's difficult in teams or can be difficult in teams regardless of the size. I think really it's about kind of taking away the stigma, promoting the conversation about education, really. So, you know, why is there a particular stigma around this what is the particular challenge in the team that you're dealing with because it it could be a range of kind of different different reasons is it because it's mainly a male dominated team or you know is it something else that's driving that kind of difficulty I guess in raising the conversation um I think I think the key really is about support materials so you know if you've got a policy it's quite clear then as you know as you would if you've got a sickness policy or a disciplinary policy you've got a kind of stance in terms of what the how the organization views that particular topic um, so I think the policy can definitely help. Um, and then I guess it's around education. So educating leaders in those teams. How do they start a conversation? How do they, how do they, um, what tools can they use, I guess, to kind of help to break down that stigma? Yes. I don't know if any of the other panellists would like to um, contribute also. Yeah, I'm happy to say, and, and I reiterate what you said there, Emma. I think it, it is talking about it. I think that's what I said is if we talk about it, we take some of the power out of it, it's, it stops being this mysterious thing. Um, and that first aspect is is recognising it, being open, um, being honest with yourself about it. And and as I said, I, I don't feel embarrassed talking about it, but I do tend to think, you know, my director, for example, is a guy, so I think, is he going to be embarrassed about it? But do you know what? We're all human beings. We're all aware of these things. Um, so it is very much just talking about it, being open about it. And I think it's also recognising um, and looking at colleagues as well, because if you're open about it, you'll be surprised at the amount of people that reach out to you and say, that's exactly what I'm going through. And again, it helps to have that sharing of experiences as well. And if you think about the more people you, you engage with in the business, the more people they're going to engage with. And pretty soon you get quite a domino effect of um, people at all levels in the organisation having a better understanding of it. Great, thank you. Um, we've, we've got a question here about advice for business owners themselves who are experiencing these symptoms. So we've been talking about how to look after our, our employees as businesses, but um, any particular advice that the panel can give for business owners themselves? I'll add that to uh, anyone who'd like to take that. I don't mind trying to have a have a go at that one, um, Emma. I think you know it's really 
you know you need to look after yourself as well as as well as your colleagues as well and I think if you think you have got sort of symptoms you know I've I've read up a lot about it I follow certain people sort of on Instagram and uh, Davina McCall I know has done quite a lot of documentaries about it and I've actually I bought her book um, and I went on holiday in August and actually um I just it was it was a breath of fresh air the book because I could recognize in things that were in the book that were in myself as well and then prompted me to take some action to actually go to the doctor and be quite sort of determined that you know, I was going to have a proper conversation about it to help them understand um, how I felt so you know I've, I've taken quite a bit of that action myself and I think once you understand it yourself then you can support um support um, your colleagues better but I think you you can support yourself as well and there are online forum groups to, to join as well where you can just read how you know people are feeling and things that they've put into place as well but I think it does start with understanding yourself and realizing actually you know to Bernie's point you know you, you have not got dementia you're not depressed you are just probably showing signs of menopause and I think there is that myth that it's just all about hot sweats but as we've seen today there are so many other symptoms and, and Bernie talked about brain fog and I would probably say brain fog for me is is far worse than the the hot sweats because we are we are all individuals. Thank you thanks Catherine that's really helpful and there are a few further uh, legal questions if I can sort of put three together for uh, for Emma Mills and so um, one is about whether the employers are legally allowed to ask an employee um, whether or not they uh, are perimenopause or not. And then from an employee's perspective, um, should an employee raise symptoms as soon as they start, so that 12-month period is logged appropriately? Um, so I could put those to you, Emma Mills, please. Yeah, sure. So happy happy to deal with that. So sh- should an employer ask an employee outright if they, if they have perimenopause, perimenopause or, or menopause? There isn't an absolute rule that says that you cannot do that, but I would caution any employer to exercise real caution about doing that. Um, I think, you know, we've acknowledged people have different levels of of tolerance and comfort about discussing this in the workplace. Um, You should consider this just like any other health condition from this perspective, you might have an idea about what what is an issue, but any conversation that you're going to have has to be handled very sensitively and recognising that an employee may not wish to discuss issues with you. Um, And you don't need to ask somebody outright from a legal perspective. As, As I said, yes, you've got those issues around constructive knowledge, but if you are not aware of an issue, then you, you won't be found liable for discriminating against that person. And I think there's a, there's a fine line between being a supportive employer and potentially getting yourself into hot water by making assumptions about what is going on in somebody's life when that may not be relevant. And, and potentially in itself, that's sex discrimination because you wouldn't be putting a similar issue to a, to a male employee. And I think there's a couple of comments I've seen around the fact that it isn't only women um, in this sense, there is a broader population that may experience uh, menopausal type symptoms. And so there needs to be an acknowledgement of that. So I think I I would exercise great caution, I think, before having that kind of conversation. As to the other side, as to whether you should be logging symptoms as soon as you experience them, raising them, I think think that's a judgment call. Um, I I think it, it depends on the context for you. But if you genuinely think that it is having an impact on you at work then I think you know if if you're comfortable to do so I think you should be raising that and having a conversation with that both so that you can genuinely get the support hopefully that you need to improve the situation but also thinking about it more negatively I suppose putting in place steps to protect yourself if you end up in the unfortunate situation of not getting the support that you want or need and, and, and facing challenges at work but going back to the earlier comment I think the long term element of the test is probably one of the easier ones to meet. So I don't think that you need to get particularly hung up on thinking I need to have tracked a 12 month period um, of issues. If you ultimately have your own evidence about what the impact has been, maybe you've spoken to your GP, maybe you've done other things that may in itself be sufficient. So you don't necessarily feel that you have to be raising things as soon as you experience them. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just conscious of time. We've got uh, one minute to, to uh, one o'clock. So um, if we can just move the, the slide along. Um, 
see on this slide some really useful resources on the screen. Um, we will circulate these slides to everyone who has registered and the recording of the webinar will be circulated to those who registered in the week commencing the 27th of November. Um, we will um, look at the questions that remain in the Q&A um, and I'm sure we get back to you to answer those questions and um, feel free to get in touch with us um, if, if you wish to. So um, it remains for me to thank once again our partners for this webinar, the Cooperative Bank, Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce, DLA Piper, Women in Banking and Finance and thanks to the Federation of Small Businesses. And to particularly thank our panellists, who I think they've all really done a fantastic job, Emma Mills, Emma Redfern, Bernie McEverly and Catherine Douglas. And to thank you all for attending and for the questions. And I hope that you've learned a lot today. Thank you very much.